All right, for those of you guys who asked, I told you we would get into this in more detail. So our essential question here is really how do flowering plants reproduce? So how do our angiosperms reproduce? So there's a lot of detail. And this could go on further, but we'll keep it simple. These parts should be a review. So remember, we've got four types of modified leaves. So fun fact, these guys are modified leaves, all the stuff that we talk about. Okay. But we have the sepals. They at first enclose to protect the flower bud. We already had that one. The petals are those colorful, fragrant advertisers for pollinators. So we hopefully know the petals. Three is the stamens. So the stamens, again, is the male part because of the men in it. So it's the male, male flower parts. So it consists of the stalk, which we call the filament, and then the anther, which is on top of it. It's going to produce, it contains sacs, which produce pollen. So this is our pollens produced. Okay. Carpels, the other one, um, have a long slender neck called the style and a sticky stigma at the tip. The base of the carpel is the ovary, which extends one or more ovules containing a developing egg and supporting cells. Okay, the stigma is on top and is a platform for pollen. And the term pistil, which we've already seen in some of our stuff, but the term pistil is used to refer to a single carpel or a group of fused carpels. Okay, so there's some of our terms there. Again, the carpels are the female parts. Okay, so things to note. We'll look at some of these later. The, um, I think the animation sh should be, if there's a OneDrive link online, it'll have these animations available to you. They just won't play as we go along here, because it just won't tap. Again, flowering plants. So these are, again, all of our angiosperms. So we know that we're talking about angiosperms in particular. So we're talking about that lineage there. Just to review, again, I've got unlabeled diagrams of this for you guys to practice, but we know the petal, we know the sepals down here, the carpal is this guy in the middle, and we'll, oh, this lady rather in the middle. And when we go through our kind of angiosperm dissection, we'll actually see that in better detail about what it looks like. But it contains the sticky stigma, the style, and the ovary at the bottom, which includes the ovule, okay, which will help develop into a seed. Then the other parts around it is the stamen, our male parts, with the anther, which is going to produce the pollen, and the filament, which holds it. Okay. So this is at least part of a review. Okay, let's see. There is a lot to this, and we'll look at the words, and we'll look at the highlights together, but we'll go through a diagram, which will hopefully show you that it still applies to the whole general diagram. So this one might be a time where you, you pause as you go along and refer back to the general diagram and just kind of see where we are on the cycle of things. Because we're still doing alternation of generations. So in the life cycle of a generalized an angiosperm, fertilization occurs within the ovule, um, within the flower. So fertilization in the ovule within a flower. The ovary will develop into a fruit. These are key points. The ovule will become the seed. These are things you want to note. Okay. And it contains the embryo. The fruit protects the seed and aids in dispersing it. So the fruit is actually kind of a protective coat. This is also why we say that these aren't like gymnosperms, which are naked seeds. These are seeds that are protected by the fruit on the outside. Okay. So completing the life cycle, the seed then germinates or begins to grow in a suitable habitat. So Germination is the part where you see the seeds starting to like sprout. Okay, the embryo develops into a seedling, which is just like a baby plant. It's like a toddler, plant toddler is a seedling, and then the seedling will grow into a mature plant. So this is basic life cycle of a flowering plant. Again, well, so animations are available to you. So let's say we have, um, which this one isn't entirely accurate, but it's okay. We're gonna go with it. Is we've got a fruit and it contains the seed within it. Okay, we can start really anywhere because it's a cycle. I see the seed, so that's where I'm thinking at, but we can start. Let's 
start there, containing the seed. So the fruit with the seed. The seed, once it finds its area, will have our seed. It will plant. It will land somewhere, plant. It'll, sometimes it'll plant, but it'll land, and it will actually germinate or begin to grow. Then it turns into a seedling, which is a little baby plant, and that will eventually become the mature plant. So if we wanted to go in the steps that were listed here, first we have the mature plant with the flower and the ovule within the ovary which would develop into the fruit and then into the seed. Okay, This is where fertilization occurs. We get the fruit from that. The fruit will give us the seed with the developing embryo. The seed germinates. We get a seedling. We get back to this whole thing. So that's our plant life cycle. That one's not quite so bad, and it's worth kind of noting that. Hopefully, at least it's intuitive, and you've kind of, although we're giving some terms to it, you've seen this before. Alright, here is where we get to involve the alternation of generations business. A lot of stuff here. And I will tell you, I don't ask a whole whole lot of questions about this, but just to kind of show you that you still know what's going on. And some people have asked me some really pointed questions on this stuff, so I want to answer those. But if you're confused and you go through this stuff and you're like, I am lost, the big thing is go back to the general life cycle, or alternation of generation cycle, and make sure that you know that. But let's go through this bit. Okay, so the plant life cycle involves alternating diploid and haploids. That part we got. The diploid plant, again, is the sporophyte. So this is good review for that whole alternation of generations business. Specialized diploid cells in the anthers and the ovules undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores. So just so you know, the sporophyte we get from the, the little uh, page we did, it's essentially like the whole plant, the whole like tree. Let's see if I can draw you a quick tree. It's also the whole, you know, lovely little, oh my God, it's going to ter look terrible. But here, here's your flower. So it's going to be the, the nice flower. I, my ugly drawings for you today. But it's either the tree or the flower. All those things are sporophytes because we have, diploid cells in the anthers and the ovules that will actually produce the spores. That's what's happening within the whole big thing is that they're actually producing spores within those flowers. The haploid spores will undergo mitosis to produce the haploid generation. This is where a gametophyte will come into play. So the haploid generation is called the gametophyte, which produces gametes via mitosis. At fertilization, the gametes from male and female gametophytes unite to give us a zygote. So this is the same thing as that whole cycle that we drew. Okay, so look at that warm-up that we did. Okay, but it's going to be more complicated here. So we're going to take it kind of step by step. Instead of trying to, as my old coach would say, eat the elephant and try to get all this at once, let's go one piece at a time. So this is actually development of the male gametophyte, which we said is our pollen grain. This is the keyest point, is that the pollen grain is the whole male plant the whole of it okay so in the anther there's cells and they'll produce our little spores but look how well contained those little spores are they don't get out a whole lot okay instead of actually kind of being released into the environment like we would see they're staying there kind of with the plant when they undergo mitosis enough they'll produce a cell that becomes the pollen grain okay and so that's the big thing that we have to know is that the spores are formed here these spores develop into the pollen grain. So we go spores to pollen grain, and the pollen grain is our male gametophyte. It's really, really reduced down in this um, kind of plant lineage in our, in our angiosperm. So how do we get the female gametophyte? So the female gametophyte, again, is just the embryo sac. It's just a very reduced thing that we can't see. So we have the ovule where the seed will develop, right? And so that we've got a haploid spore that's here. So we've got haploid spores that develop within this. And they'll undergo mitosis again to produce the whole embryo sac. And that's it. So the gametophytes are so reduced down in the angiosperms that we, bear, we can't even see them. I mean, you can see pollen, but you don't recognize that as an entire plant. But like the entire plant is within that pollen grain. It's pretty intense. So how pollination works is that the actual pollen grain will land at the sticky site of the stigma on the um, carpal, right? <clears throat> so 
So what it does is it actually grows down. Let's see if I can get the little marker to one work. Okay. It'll grow down and it'll contain two sperm with it. So what happens is it meets the, the pollen tube is what's that the what it struggled words today. So the pollen tube is what that is called. So the pollen tube continues to grow down and then at some point the two sperm that are there will uh, meet the egg that is located within the embryo sac and then we'll actually get um, the zygote. Hello, there we go, the zygote. That's our ultimate goal. I will say there's some other stuff that kind of happens here, which is called double fertilization. It just means that we're going to get the zygote, but we also get this kind of other fertilization that happens. Notice there's two sperm that are here. It just helps to kind of feed the, um, the developing embryo. So it's sort of like a food source type extra bit. Okay, so you can sort of know double fertilization occurs here. Two sperm kind of fertilize two sort of egg pieces, but one part becomes the zygote and the other sort of becomes this like food source. Let's see if I can get my words right today. It's a, it's a complicated cycle. All right, so pollen grains are the male gametophytes. We got that part. All right. So the, the cells that develop into pollen grains are found within the flower's anthers. Each cell first undergoes mitosis, forming haploid spores. Each spore divides by mitosis, forming haploid cells, and then the tube cell and, uh, the, and a generative cell. The generative cell passes into the tube cell and a thick wall forms around them. The resulting pollen grain is ready for release from the anther. So if you like the words a little bit better, there's the wording on that one. I'm just more interested in seeing the whole general cycle. Again, the female gametophyte is the embryo sac. The cell and the ovule undergoes meiosis to produce haploid spores. Three of the spores degenerate. The surviving spore undergoes a series of mitotic divisions to become the embryo sac and the female gametophyte. There we go. The sac contains a large central cell with two haploid nuclei. Okay, one of its other cells is a haploid egg ready to be fertilized. So a lot kind of happening there. All right, it is a good pause, place to pause. I don't, I just cannot word today. I hope this lecture goes well for you because I am losing my ability to speak words. I'm going to try real hard to get it together for the rest of this, but this might be a good place for both of us to take a quick break. Regroup, write some questions out, think about it, and then come back to it. So pollination is the transfer of pollen from one anther to the stigma. Okay, so that's how it's pollinating. And we saw that in some of the little videos that we watched, how we, we had a couple of pollinators bringing in pollen to certain things. So it's the transfer of pollen from an anther to a stigma. So pollen can be carried by wind, water, or animals, as we saw. After pollination, the pollen grain germinates on the stigma. Its tube cells give rise to a pollen tube, which grows downward into the ovary. Meanwhile, the generative cell divides by mitosis, forming two sperm. So that's sort of where we're getting the kind of double fertilization. There's two sperm, and there are going to be two places where the sperm can meet and fuse. So when the pollen tube reaches the base of the ovule, it enters the ovary and discharges its two sperm near the embryo sac. One sperm fertilizes the egg developing into a diploid zygote. The other contributes to a haploid nucleus to a large diploid central, central cell of the embryo sac. So it's kind of the embryo sac, it's gonna be sort of a food source to kind of help the zygote develop. All right, so that's that double fertilization. So this cell, which is now is triploid in its nucleus, will give rise to the food storing tissue called the endosperm. So that's our food storing or food source that we talked about. And this is where we get, it's called double fertilization. The resulting production of endosperm is unique to angiosperms. So this business right here is another thing that's completely unique to our flowering plants. So endosperm would develop only in ovules containing a fertilized egg, therefore preventing angiosperms from squandering nutrients. They don't want to screw it up. We have nutrients and then we're going to have a developing ovary. We will make sure that we get them the proper nutrients. 
So it's a good developmental strategy. Okay. So we'll look at these. Again, I think they're available to you, all these little, little videos. I put the link up so you could check them out yourself. I just, it won't let me click them here. Okay, so it's just the way it goes. All right, so after fertilization, the ovule containing the triploid central cell and the diploid zygote begins to develop into a seed. So all that stuff there, our ovule, develops into the seed. Pay attention to the things that are repeated, like the ovule develops into the seed, the ovary develops into the fruit. These are things that are more important than the nuances of whether we can get, you know, all the endosperm and all that kind of stuff. So pay attention to these things. Hint, hint, wink, wink. All right, the seed will stockpile proteins, oils, and starches. Embryonic development begins when the zygote divides by mitosis into two cells. So the repeated division of one of the cells then produces a ball of cells that will become the embryo, because that's an embryo is a ball of cells. Meanwhile, the triploid cell, so that was our endosperm that kind of feed it, feeds it, uh, will form a thread of cells that anchors the embryo to the parent plant and pushes the embryo into the endosperm. It's like, what are we talking about? Okay, here's what we'll have. Triploid cell, we've got the ovule, the developing zygote, notice it's dividing, and we're getting a whole kind of ball of cells here with the embryo. Well, what will happen with the endosperm is it'll kind of feed it and push it along throughout the seed so it's kind of going in the right directions. It's helping organization, it's helping feed it, helping it develop and grow properly. The result of the embryonic development in the ovule is a mature seed. Okay, ovule seed. Near the end of its maturation, the seed loses most of its water and forms a hard resistant seed coat that will keep it sort of dormant, dormant seed. So seed to dormancy, that's a good one to remember, but it's, this one's intuitive, is a condition in which growth and development are suspended temporarily, and it's a key evolutionary adaptation. So dormancy actually allows the time uh, for the plant to disperse the seeds, and then it increases the chance of a new generation of plants that will begin growing when environmental conditions like temperature and moisture favor survival. So just being able to kind of sit out and wait for conditions to be right is a good evolutionary adaptation instead of just like, oh, I'm going to grow. Oh, wait, there's no nutrients for me. I'm dying. It's, they can just wait it out. Just pause. It's kind of a little, like, what pause button that allows them to kind of pause it until the conditions are right again. Sort of like what we saw with latent viruses, the whole viral dormancy and that kind of lysogenic cycle. It's similar to that. So a couple of things to note here is that in the eudicot, and our dicots, like a bean, the embryo is an elongated structure with two cotyledons, it's got our dicotyledons, and no endosperm, because its cotyledons absorb the endosperm. Endosperm and nutrients is the seed form. And that monocot, that one cotyledon, like a kernel of corn, actually the fruit contains one seed. Unlike the bean, the corn seed contains a large endosperm, and a single thin cotyledon. So again, these are some differences that we would be ab able to add on to the eudicot, monodicot thing. Mo monodicot. I just realized I said that monocot. We're going to get there together. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so we've got the seed coat, and you see these large, two large cotyledons is what's here. Okay, so those are two large cotyledons, so we don't really have a whole lot of room for endosperm. However, in a monocot, you will still see the endosperm developing within the kernel, and then we have one cotyledon forming, one seed leaf forming. Okay, it's just a difference. While the seeds are developing into ovules, seeds and ovules, repeat it again, hormonal changes trigger fertilization and cause the flower's ovaries to grow and thicken and mature into a fruit. Once again, a fruit is a mature ovary. And it acts like a vessel, housing and protecting seeds, helping disperse them from the parent plant. Although a fruit typically consists of a mature ovary, it can include other flower parts as well. So a peat pod is a really good example that we can look at. Maybe. There, not in this one. But this one's available to you too, it should be. But we can sort of see, so we've got a peat pod, and there's a better example coming up, I know of it. There we go. This figure will show it to us. 
So you can sort of see is that there, we've got an upper part of the carpal, and then you can see the ovules here, so our seeds are our ovules, and it'll actually include part of the sepal and the ovary wall. So there's a couple other flower parts that are included uh, in the fruit <laughs> fruits per se here. But it works. All right, good place. We're at 20 minutes. is a good place to take a break, pause, and then come right back. So mature fruits may be fleshy or dry. So examples of fleshy ones are oranges, plums, grapes. They're fleshy fruits that you would know of. Okay. And so the wall of the ovary is actually soft, softened during ripening. Dry fruits are what you wouldn't necessarily think of like beans and nuts and grains. So the dry wind dispersed seeds of grasses are harvested on the plant are a major staple of people. Okay, so fleshy fruits up here, dry fruits down here. So you've probably seen these things. You didn't even know that these are the fruits of maple plants. Maple plants, maple tree. Okay, and it also includes all the rest of these things. These things are delicious to eat. Peanuts and pistachios and stuff. Okay. Various adaptations of fruits help disperse seeds. So seeds of some flowering plants, such as dandelions and maples, so you see the little wings on the maple ones, contained within fruits act like kites or propellers. So let's see if I can get back here without shutting off. If you see, it's got like these little wings on it. It looks sort of like a boomerang, like it's meant to catch wind. So those are wind dispersions. So are dandelions. That's what you blow it in the little, that's actually a little kite kind of taking the seed away for you. Coconuts are adapted to, for dispersal by water, that's why they float. Many angiosperms rely on animals to carry seeds that cling to their fur and just the fruits. That's the whole point of making a fruit delicious, is that if uh, we eat the fruit and then it processes and it comes out, sometimes it'll come out with a lovely little, um, you know, nutrient packet that we would think of as like fertilizer, like manure, and that helps improve conditions for that particular plant for it to germinate. So germination, a seed takes up water and restarts the growth and development that was temporarily suspended during dormancy. Eudicot seedlings like beans, the embryonic root emerges first, so the root is first and then grows downward. The shoot, shoots emerged in this kind of like hooked downward thing. I'll show you in a second. Actually, I'll show you now. So if you sort of see it, we're going to develop where the root will go down as it's supposed to, but there's this kind of hooked situation on the very top of it. So it protects the seed going down, and it will make the stem go up and hooked before it kind of makes leaves and goes out. So these are our dicots here. Okay. Corn and other monocots are a little bit different. They actually have a protective sheath uh, surrounding the shoot that pushes upward and breaks through the soil. So the shoot tip then grows up through the tunnel provided by the sheath, and the corn cotyledon remains in the soil and decomposes. So what that sort of looks like is that it's just kind of the kernel keeps it safe, and the shoot can come up directly, and the roots can come down directly, and it keeps it protected until, no, oh, okay, it's ready and developed, and then it sort of disappears. Okay. But this one's kind of a direct up and down, whereas the eudicots have this kind of hooked situation. All right, so asexual reproduction is also called vegetative propagation, and it results from um, asexually produced offspring or cloning. And this is genetically identical to a single parent. This is actually done a ton, and you may not even realize it. But asexual reproduction in angiosperms and other plants is an extension of their capacity to grow throughout life. So asexual reproduction in plants often, often involves what's called fragmentation, or separation of the plant parent plant into parts to develop whole plants. How can you do that? So a garlic bulb is actually an underground stem that functions as storage. So a single large bulb can fragment into several parts that we call cloves, if anybody cooks. So each clove can give rise to a separate plant as indicated by the green shoots emerging from some of them. I actually have some right now. I should see about bringing them that actually have the stem kind of emerging in them which is fascinating. You can also do it to potatoes. So potatoes have those little kind of like eyelets in them. You know what I'm talking about? The little, the little dots in them. 
if you actually cut a potato and keep those little eyelets in there and then plant that whole little section underground with the eyelet, it will grow. Then you get plant stuff. My grandma was funny about it. She's notorious about growing more like green onion because apparently you can just cut off the bottom of those and take where the roots are and throw them outside and they will grow for you and then they will not stop growing. <laughs> so again, a lot of that's asexual reproduction and so we can use that for our own kind of agricultural needs or horticulture, if you will. So each of the small trees that you see in a sprout and the roots of the coastal redwood each small tree develops its own root system separate from the parent tree. <clears throat> so even these big guys here kind of have a connected underground sort of root system. The rings of plant, the, the ring of plants is a clone of a crea, um, creosote bushes that are in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. So all these bushes come from generations of asexual reproduction by roots. Am I crazy? So these like ring structures that you would see all have this sort of asexual thing and there's a connection underneath them. Some aspen groves such as those shown in our next figure will consist of thousands of trees descended by an asexual reproduction from the root system of a single parent. So even all these guys have the same thing. It's effective strategy, man. The ability of plants to reproduce asexually provides many opportunities for growers to produce large numbers of plants with minimal effort and expense. Like my grandma will buy one set of green onions and then she will throw it somewhere and then she will have green onions for ever. Like one and done is her strategy on that one. So most of our fruit trees and houseplants are asexually propagated from cuttings. Raspberries are cut, uh, propagated from root sprouts potatoes from pieces of underground stems. That was the one I was telling you about. Most varieties of wine grapes are produced by grafting a bud from one plant onto a closely related sort of other plant. But plants can be cultured on specialized media. This is literally, I did this. I have done this. It is not enjoyable, but I have done that. I grew a Rabidopsis that way. Oh, God, that's not do you think some of the labs we've done are, are tedious? You have not experienced research, my friend, and just be happy that you haven't. <laughs> so some plants can survive a really long time. Those coastal redwoods are two to 3,000 years old. They've seen some stuff. They don't want to tell you. They, uh, our next tree that's shown is about 4,600 years old. It's a bristlecone pine. So a long life increases evolutionary fitness by increasing the number of reproductive opportunities. Again, that's our key for evolutionary success is more reproductive opportunities. Only does long life work if we get more reproductive opportunities. Okay, so this guy's 4,600 years old. I don't even want to know what it's experienced too much. Okay. Several adaptations allow plants to live much longer than animals. So adult trees, like most adult plants, re kind of retain meristems, which allow for that continued growth and repair. A tree can replace organs that have been lost or damaged by trauma or disease. It does something. A thick wood can protect against insects, disease, fires, all kinds of stuff. So they've got, really got an evolutionary advantage. All right. So that will be a good place to stop. Again, remember the key is to look at alternation of generations in general if some of that's tough. You know, it answers some of the questions that I know have been asked, but if nothing else, just keep it as general as possible to not confuse yourself. Make sure you're looking at flower parts and then some of the new material that we've talked about here too. So look at all of the things that we see. Okay, but also make sure, just kind of keep an eye on what, what's being repeated, what develops into what. Okay, ovaries develop into fruits, okay, ovules develop into seeds, those kinds of things that we're looking at. They're repeated over and over again. So keep those things in mind as you continue to work through it. So that's the end of that. If you have any questions at all, please come by or shoot me an email.